So, what do you do to become an entrepreneur? Um, so I got to do the graduation thing. I got to be the graduation speaker for the computer science department in December. They, you know, they graduate every, twice a year, and I was their speaker. And what I spoke about was your free time, the use of your free time, how you use your free time. And if you look across America at averages, none of us are like this, but across America, averages, you know, the average person watches four hours of TV a day. That's just how it is. And the average person spends X hours surfing the internet. And the average person spends so much time playing video games and, you know, whatever they do. In a lot of cases, that is free time squandered. It's, you know, if you're just sitting there watching television, unless your business idea is to create a new television show and you're actively doing research, if you're just vegging on the couch four hours a day watching TV or, you know, playing the latest video game or whatever, I'm not saying that's a, a bad thing. I mean, it's your free time so you can do whatever you want. But if you're going to become an entrepreneur, what you're going to do is instead capture that free time and you're going to use it to get your business started. Now you can create a gigantic block of free time by quitting your job and doing nothing but your business. Then you have all free time. I know several people in that mode right now. They are so convinced that their businesses are going to work that they have stopped doing anything else and they're focused on it. And when how stuff works was getting going. There was a period uh, where I was working at another company that I had started, and I needed to make a transition. So I start how stuff works as a guy at his kitchen table with a hobby, and it grows and it grows and it grows and it wins you know, awards and it has traffic and all this stuff. And a business guy comes to me, somebody who knows how to raise venture capital comes to me and he says, I think we can make this a viable venture backed business. Can I be your partner? And so we formed a partnership to go get venture capital. Well, at this point, I was under the impression that this was going to succeed. So I quit my job. I freed up 16, 18, 20 hours of free time a day. My wife, who was pregnant at the time, thought I was utterly insane and nearly had a heart attack. But nonetheless, that's what happened. And we did raise the money, and then we raised more money, and so on, and it actually worked out. So you have however much free time you have. It's either the time, you know, you have work and play and sleep. It's either your play time, or it's that you have play and play and sleep and it's your all your waking time those are you know those are your free times to become an entrepreneur you're going to take that free time and you're going to use it to start a business if you've never started a business before what you're going to do is you're going to use it for a period of time to learn how to start a business by doing obvious things like reading um, working at a company that does what you are planning to do so that you can learn the ropes going to seminars, plowing through Google, you're basically going to saturate your brain in business ideas and knowledge until it makes sense. And you're going to do that the same way you do anything else. You're going to spend hours of time absorbing information until you feel like you're ready to get something going and then you're going to use your free time to start up the business. This is how businesses get started. This is how you become an entrepreneur, is by tapping your free time and using it to start a business. So let me just describe three businesses I've started using that principle. Okay, the first business I started, I was teaching here as a graduate student, much like you. Okay, I was here in the computer science department finishing my master's degree and teaching on a stipend. I wrote a book in my free time. So at nights and on weekends, I wrote a book on a certain programming system. Um, unbeknownst to me, at that exact same moment on Wall Street, Wall Street had made a decision to abandon mainframes and move to Unix workstations running the system I was writing about. Okay. Two, so here's two threads. 
They have not intersected. They are just proceeding through time. So I finished my master's degree and it's time to leave. I could go work, but I had a friend and he and I said, we're going to take this summer and we're going to try to start a business. We don't know what the business will do exactly, but we are going to think that it's a software consulting business. The two of us are going to, we had no business experience. We don't have a clue. We don't know what an invoice is. We know nothing. We are going to take the summer and we're going to figure out something about business. And we're going to try to start a software development or consulting firm. And at the end of the summer, we're going to evaluate. Either it's going to have worked and something you know, will give us reason to go on, or it's just going to have been a, you know, a fun three months, but it didn't work and we're going to go get jobs. That was our decision. So we, what did we do? We maximized our free time by devoting ourselves to a summer of starting a business, and we did it. We had $400 in startup capital. We had his PC, and we had my book. Those were our assets at startup. So we went cluelessly out into the world and started seeking clients. Well, so here's the luck part. These two threads, eventually someone on Wall Street reads my book and says, hey, can you come up and train our developers? And if you look at a Wall Street firm, any Wall Street firm, they have hundreds of software developers who needed to be retrained in Unix platform stuff. And so we just completely stumbled and fell into this gigantic training market on Wall Street. And we're able to train in an industry that pays trainers extremely well using the book is basically our resume, okay? Because it looks impressive if you've written a book. So, and if you want a way to use free time, if, like if you have a bunch of free time and you're spending it watching TV or video games or whatever and you just don't know what to do, just write a book about anything. <laughs> just pick a topic, write a book. It, it impresses people. I mean, it takes time to write a book. It's not an easy process, but it is a, a very straightforward process. You write page one, and then page two, and then page three, until you have 200 pages, and it's a book. It's a very straightforward, linear process. It gives you great credibility. Even if you don't know necessarily what you're talking about, the book <laughs> lends the impression that you do know what you're talking about. So in this case, I did know what I was talking about, fortunately. And we made a ton of money. When I left that company, we had like 20, 25-ish employees. We were making millions of dollars a year doing software consulting. Having started with $400, a PC and a book, and zero experience. We learned it all as we went along. Okay, that's business one. Business two, I wrote a book for teenagers. It was like my eighth book, and I could not find a publisher for it. No one wanted to touch it. So. Uh, my wife and I said, how hard can it be to start a publishing company? And today, it's dirt simple to start a publishing company. But this was before um, Lulu and you know, Ex Libris and all the other companies that make it dirt simple. It's, you know, this was when you had to actually go to printers and print 10,000 books and warehouse them and stuff like that. So you know, naively, having never done it before, we said, how hard can it be to start a publishing company? So, we took my book, we typeset it, we went and got it printed by a real book printer, so it was a real book. Warehoused it, figured out how to interact with bookstores, did a PR tour, advertised, did all this stuff, and the book worked. It's like in its 10th printing now. It's still in print. It's, um, you know, it's a book for teenagers. And it worked. We, we did that, and decided we really didn't like publishing books. It wasn't a lot of fun. So that's the only book we ever published. But that, that business worked. You know, we sold tens of thousands of copies of that book, probably more than 100,000. Well, yeah, well over 100,000. And if you look at you know, what the book cost, which was $20 at retail, it made millions of dollars. So again, we did that. That was just a. That was a lark. That was just, here's what we're doing. We're going to make this publishing company. Third business was How Stuff Works, which I told you a little bit about. It started as a hobby. 
because I liked writing about how stuff works. I loved writing about how things worked. And so I just put up little web pages. And when I hit about 20, luck struck again. And what happened, for reasons I can't completely explain, is after I had about 20 articles on how things like engines and pendulum clocks and batteries worked, it reached a critical mass that was interesting to people. And at that moment in history, the web was still new, and every magazine and TV show and newspaper had this thing called cool site of the day or cool site of the week or cool sites or hot sites or whatever. So one of those picked up how stuff works and said, you know, and it was Mozilla at the time. Mozilla picked it up and they said, wow, here's a cool article on water towers. You should read it. So this big traffic spike for two days. So, it, but here's what happened. If you look, there was like whatever the baseline traffic was, and then this massive spike, and then it would come down, but then the baseline had moved up, like the plateau had changed. Well, what happened is this whole hot site of the week thing was incestuous. So lazy people would just look at what other people were referencing and then use that as their hot site of the week. So what happened is it made it through the whole hot site of the weekosphere and got hit. It, it was in Time and USA Today and every one you can ever think of, it was in all of them. And so every spike brought the plateau up. And I got massive exposure in a relatively short period of time by having a blob of content, let's not use the word blob, a collection of content <laughs> that people happened to really like. They would tell their friends about it. It resonated is the word I used to talk about that. Um, and it, you know, it got a lot of exposure that way. And then um, what happened is at the time the kind of the the highest award you could win in the United States was called the coolest site of the, of the week. Yes, and, and then there, or it was, well, it was something along those lines. And, and then they did cool site of the year. And I won in my category, and then I won the grand prize as well. I was the coolest site on the internet <laughs> for a year. <laughs> <laughs> for reasons I can't explain. And it, if you looked at who I was competing against at the time, that was utterly ridiculous because I was a guy <laughs> in a basement competing against companies that had $100 million in venture capital that were trying their hardest to win awards like that and had been beaten. It was just weird, strange. And so that was enough credibility to go get venture capital. So you can see luck <coughs> kind of hitting in there, but it hit because I had created the site. You know, I, I had put, I, I was playing the game, and so luck could, could hit. 